could see a whole new level up to this battle over the border with Republicans expected to recommend impeaching a top Biden official and huge questions over whether the president can shut down the border himself. We're live in just a second with a gut check on the humanitarian crisis and the potential political fallout. Also, at any minute, we may find out more about the president's cryptic comment that he's made up his mind on how to respond to those deadly drone attacks on U.S. troops in Jordan. Who else knows what his decision is? And when might the rest of the world find out? Then elsewhere in the region, a closer look in our original tonight at the accusations Israel uses hunger as a weapon of war. Plus, an NBC News exclusive live from Beijing, a word you don't often hear related to the fight against the global spread of fentanyl. Optimism. We'll explain why. And then our breakdown, everything you ever wanted to know about the Fed, but we're afraid to ask ahead of a big meeting that could affect interest rates, your mortgage, your money, and more. And would you let Elon Musk put a chip in your brain? Well, somebody did. Why? We're getting to that later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're starting tonight with the humanitarian crisis at the border. And House Republicans pushing what they think could be part of the solution any minute, set to recommend impeaching the Homeland Security Secretary. I want to show you this live right here, a break in the debate at the moment. But it's a debate to try to kick Alejandro Mayorkas out of office. We're watching for a vote. We're watching for things to pick back up. We'll bring you any action as soon as we get it. With Republicans accusing Mayorkas of, one, refusing to follow the law, and two, knowingly saying things that weren't true to get in the way of DHS oversight. We want to be clear here. The chances of a conviction are slim to none. Only one cabinet secretary has ever been impeached and convicted. That was back when Heinz Ketchup first came out, 1876. That vote failed. Over on the other side of Capitol Hill, senators are working on a different plan to try to get a handle on the border, allowing the government to spend more money there and giving President Biden the power to shut the border down in certain cases, a power that the president definitely wants. Listen. Give me the power. I've asked for the very day I got in office. Give me the border control. Give me the people, give me the people to judge it. Give me the people who can stop this and make it work fast. Okay, so does the president really need the congressional green light to shut down the border? Does he need Congress's approval or can he do it himself? Current and former Homeland Security officials tell our team technically he could do it on his own, but that could be super chaotic because of legal challenges that would almost certainly pop up right away. There's no commitment from Mexico, which would have to get on board with the plan. Plus, there's some questions about what's actually realistic numbers-wise. What we do know, numbers-wise, comes from polls showing most Americans want to see something done. Nearly three-quarters of voters want more money for border security, and about one in seven say the border is their number one issue ahead of the election this fall. We're going to get more to the politics with Ryan Nobles in just a sec, but I want to start with David Noriega, who is live for us in Eagle Pass, Texas, because, David, what is happening on the ground where you are is critical for a bunch of reasons, politically, legally, from a humanitarian perspective. So tell us what you're seeing and hearing as Texas and the border is now in the national spotlight. Yeah, Hallie, I'm at the border right now. This right behind me is the Rio Grande. Crossings have actually been relatively quiet for now, especially compared to last month's record-breaking crossings. That's in large part because the river is actually quite full right now. What you see is a, a very high, very fast river, so few people are attempting the crossing. But I do want to show you, as you said, this ultimately is about people, and there are remnants here of the many thousands of migrants who have crossed the border here in recent weeks. These are clothes, backpacks, other supplies that migrants discarded on this side of the river once they made it onto U.S. territory to claim asylum. We have a, a pair of shoes that belongs to uh, uh, either a woman or a child. We have uh, a, women's, a, a woman's bra. These are things that remind you that it's often women and children who are completing this dangerous voyage. Uh, you know, you also see here all around me the concertina wire that was put up by the Texas National Guard as part of Governor Greg Abbott's Operation Lone Star. That's the, the sort of political flashpoint or standoff that's been taken, that's been playing out here in Eagle Pass in recent weeks. Now, as far as for people who live here in Texas, who live in these border communities and are having to see all of this play out in their communities, you know, some of them think that this is little more than just political theater. Earlier today, I met the uh, Maverick County Democratic Party chairwoman who basically came to Shelby Park, the park that we're at here, that the Texas National Guard took over and, and closed off to the public to sort of argue with the guardsmen, uh, uh, harangue them about why she wasn't being allowed into the park. And we talked to her shortly after that encounter. Here's what she had to say. The 
residents here in Maverick County and Eagle Pass, we know the real story. And everybody that's smart enough to know there has there is no danger. There is no invasion. Look, Holly, the numbers are low now because of seasonal variations, but it's entirely possible. In fact, most border experts that I speak to expect those numbers to start going up again as we see every year sometime in the spring. Holly? David Noriega live for us there at Eagle Pass. David, thank you. Let me bring in Ryan Nobles live for us on Capitol Hill. So, Ryan, David has walked through the humanitarian angle on the ground, what it's like in Texas along the border. Let's talk about what it's like in Washington, right? Because there is a political divide here, and it's sometimes getting heated. I want to play it for folks. Secretary Mayorkas' actions have forced our hand. They don't want solutions. They want a political issue. We're losing our country down there. This is a MAGA pathway of vengefulness. This is this is the political piece of it, right? And it is politics, especially because there is a Democrat-led Senate that is almost certainly not going to take an impeachment seriously. So what's the end game here? Well, uh, any impeachment, Hallie, is fundamentally a political exercise. Uh, whether you truly do want to see the person who you are attempting to impeach remove from office or not, the only way that you're successful is by winning the politics over something like this. And even uh, when you don't necessarily uh, reach the end goal that an impeachment is specified for in the Constitution, you still provide or you're providing the effort and the uh, and you're you're somewhat showing your constituents uh, that you're uh, concerned about an issue and that's what democrat or republicans I should say are attempting to do here with the impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas suggesting that the administration is not doing enough to deal with the border crisis now Mayorkas and democrats flatly reject it they say they're doing all that they can and Mayorkas we should point out was not given the opportunity to testify in his own defense in these impeachment proceedings did send the chairman of of the Homeland Security Committee, uh, Mark Green, a lengthy letter, seven-page letter, where he says, uh, says uh, many things, including this, you claim that we have failed to enforce our immigration laws, and that is false. So, uh, Hallie, to your point, uh, you know, there's not even a guarantee that this passes the House because Republicans have such a thin majority in the House, but even if that does happen, it is likely dead on arrival in the Senate because Democrats are in control and it requires a two-thirds majority. But what it's allowed Republicans to do is get the ish issue of immigration front and center and place blame on the Biden administration, especially heading into a heated 2024 election. I was just going to say, Ron, you're bringing up November, right? Here we are ending of January, we are going to be talking, I think we, meaning nationally, in the political mm -hmm. sphere, are going to be talking about this issue, border and immigration, for the next 10 months, because so many voters, particularly on the Republican side of the aisle, say that it is one of, if not the top issues that get them to go and cast their ballots in the first place. That is, in so many ways, the backdrop to a lot of the discussions happening in the building where you are, is the specter of November that looms here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, Hallie, it's so interesting because you, you started off by talking uh, about how it's rare that there is agreement on the issue of immigration. It's rare that the two sides can find common ground. And, you know, I've covered so many immigration debates up here. This is one of the few times where actually there's a pretty broad set of parameters that both Republicans and Democrats agree on. They agree there's a crisis. They agree there's too many undocumented people coming over the border right now for the social services and the government to handle and that something needs to be done. And we are likely to see a bipartisan package come out of the Senate that is the most conservative package as it relates to immigration in 40 years, and Republicans in the House are rejecting it. So it you know, begs the question, if you're a skeptical person, as most of us are, do you really want to solve the mm. problem if you've got an opportunity to do it at least incrementally? Uh, you know, if, you, if you're really that concerned about it, why wouldn't you at least try and find a way to get this over the finish line? Maybe they end up doing that, uh, Hallie. That's always a possibility. But right now, they are locked in a serious disagreement about this path forward, even though there's a lot they agree on when it comes to this issue. Ryan Nobles, thank you for being there and for that smart analysis and reporting, as always. Appreciate it. So listen, any minute now, we could, we could find out how the U.S. is going to respond to the deadly drone attacks that killed three U.S. service members in the Middle East and hurt dozens more. With President Biden telling reporters today his mind is made up. Listen. Yes. That's all he said. Have you made a decision on how you'll respond? He says yes. So what does that yes mean? What is the president going to do? When could it happen?
How much bigger could this strike or response or whatever it's going to be, how might it be different than the strikes the U.S. has already carried out against militants in the region? The president's walking a line here. On the one hand, consequences, he says, a response for the killing of U.S. troops. On the other hand, he doesn't want a wider war to pop off. Remember, Iran denies involvement, even though the White House says Iran-backed militants carried out the strike. It bears hallmarks of that. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist, who's posted up near the White House. So the president knows what his decision is. We do not know what his decision is, but presumably somebody in the chain of command does too, right? His National Security Council, maybe folks at the Pentagon. What do we know about that and about any potential timeline here? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Obviously, his national security team has been advising him over the last few days about potential options, things that he could do in response to uh, the actions that were taken in Jordan that resulted in the deaths of these three soldiers. Uh, and those options could be military options. They could be economic options. They could be diplomatic options. Everything would be on the table presented to the president. And as you said, he said today, yes, he has made a decision about what exactly it is he wants done as a result. So we know that his, his national security advisor, the secretary of defense, secretary of state, and others who would be in the room for that decision-making process are aware of what the president has decided. In terms of the actual execution, we don't know that. We likely won't know it until after it has happened, because that's just the nature of how military operations work. I will say that the National Security Council's, uh, one of their chief spokesmen, John Kirby, a former Navy admiral, did say during a, a gaggle today that uh, it's very possible you'll see a tiered approach, not just a single action, but potentially multiple actions over a period of time. And so that's the, the most information, really, that we've gotten about what exactly uh, it is that the president has chosen to do that his military commanders on the ground will likely ultimately be the ones to decide exactly when and how those things are carried out. Allie. All of this obviously driven, Aaron, by the killing of those three U.S. troops we talked about. As we're learning tonight, that two of those service members have been posthumously promoted, right? Absolutely. Uh, there were two specialists who were among the three who were killed, and they have been promoted. Uh, the Army Reserve has told us this evening to uh, they've been promoted to sergeants uh, after their, their deaths here in Jordan. Uh, obviously, this is something... Uh, that is uh, close to the hearts of so many people, and their families are mourning these deaths uh, in a way that only military families can really understand. Uh, I do want you to hear a little bit of what one of the uh, specialists, uh, now sergeants, family had to say uh, about, uh, about this loss. Listen. But eventually, we will like to know what happened and how, how could this happen. If we knew what we know now, we would have just said, I love you so much. I, you know, we would have held on to that phone call just a little bit longer. And so these three soldiers were part of an engineering company that was stationed uh, at Tower 22, as it were, as we understand it, were likely asleep when that uh, drone strike happened in Jordan. I can tell you, Hallie, that President Biden spoke with each of these three soldiers' families today, separate phone calls the president had this morning before he left Washington. Uh, and uh, with the family's approval, the president does plan to go to Dover Air Force Base on Friday for the... Mm dignified transfer of the remains of these three soldiers coming from overseas back here to the U.S. Alley. Aaron Gilchrist, live for us there outside the White House tonight. Aaron, thank you. So listen, take a look at this dramatic video that's just into us today. These people look like doctors and patients. They are actually Israeli forces raiding a hospital in the West Bank. You see it there. Those troops killing three militants. The IDF says had been using the hospital as a base to plan terror attacks. It's another indication of how the Israelis are trying to crack down, not just in the West Bank, but in Gaza, obviously, as the war continues since that October 7th Hamas terror attack. The Israeli prime minister now saying he's not going to withdraw his troops, even if that means ruling out the potential for a new hostage deal. With some of that framework hammered out in Paris, it calls for a truce in exchange for hostages released. But there's a couple of big sticking points among them. How long would a truce even last? Israel says it would only accept a temporary truce. Hamas demands something permanent. As we're waiting to see what comes next, our own Hala Garani is embedding on a flight, evacuating very sick, very hurt Gazans from the region, people who are desperately hoping for some kind of a pause in the fighting. This is happening against the backdrop of renewed hopes for a ceasefire, some sort of longer-term ceasefire, and that will certainly be welcome news for the tens of thousands of people who are in need of critical medical care 
just like the patients behind me on this flight. I want to bring in Raf Sanchez now, who's live for us in Tel Aviv. So let's start there, right? Because we're learning that a top Israeli minister is going to meet with the National Security Advisor of the White House tomorrow, piece together these threads, and where any level of optimism or pessimism is on the potential a truce deal could go through. So, Hallie, I spoke to a senior Israeli official earlier. This is not always a glass half full person, but he says there is hmm. a real chance that this framework hammered out by the spy chiefs, including the CIA director in Paris over the weekend, could lead to a deal. He says there are sticking points. He says nothing is done until it's done. But the fact that it was discussed at the Israeli mm. war cabinet last night is a sign of how seriously it is being taken. We heard from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu earlier today. As you said, he was speaking at a settlement in the occupied West Bank. And Halley, he is under real pressure from the far right of his own cabinet not to make concessions to Hamas. And one of the things he said was that he is not prepared to release thousands of Palestinians convicted of terrorism offenses from Israeli prisons. Now, that is one of Hamas's major demands. That appears to be a serious spanner in the works here. There may be some wiggle room. Under this proposal, the deal is for Israel's civilian hostages. Israel would have to release Palestinian prisoners in exchange, but not necessarily the most senior terror operatives. Hamas says that it is reviewing the proposal that came out of Paris. It is not, at this point, rejecting it out of hand or saying that it can go ahead. They are repeating their demand that the war end as part of any deal. But again, Hallie, maybe there's some wiggle room here. A ceasefire for 60 days that Hamas yeah. could then extend further by releasing more hostages, that could be something they could live with. Hallie. We cannot overstate how many people are watching those talks and those discussions so closely, Raf. We're also watching, obviously, what has developed in the West Bank. We showed that video at the top of this introduction here, that dramatic video of this undercover hospital raid. Again, in the West Bank, not in Gaza, different area, obviously. What else do we know about it, and what does it signal to you? So these Israeli commandos are called in, in Hebrew uh, mustaravim. They are literally people who disguise themselves as Arabs. They go undercover in the occupied West Bank, and you see them in this hospital in Jenin, the northern West Bank, 5.30 a.m. They go in, they kill one operative from Hamas, two from Islamic Jihad. They appear to have shot one of these men at very close range while he was sleeping in his hospital bed according to medical officials. And the Palestinian Authority is saying storming a hospital is a war crime. The Israelis are saying Hamas, once again, cynically operating out of hospitals. But I think what is important here, Halle, obviously the video is so striking, but what happened in Jenin is a potential glimpse of the future in Gaza. Israel has been really clear that going forward in Gaza, yeah. even when the war ends, its forces are going to be carrying out targeted raids like this one. And we may be seeing what happened in Jenin last night, or this morning rather, happening again and again in Gaza in the years to come. Ali. Raf Sanchez, live for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you. We've got some new details tonight after a tourist boat seemingly capsized off the coast of Cancun. We're learning four people were killed. Others were taken to the hospital. I'm about to show you, you can see some of the ambulances heading there. The boat was going from an island near Cancun over to the mainland when this happened. You see it on the map. I want to bring in Morgan Chesky, who's been following it. So, Morgan, police have now detained the captain of the boat, right? What do they think happened? Yeah, that is very much under debate, Hallie. We do know that this small vessel was leaving Isla Mujeres, that popular tourist hotspot just off the coast of Mexico, and it was coming back with 19 people on board. Authorities say two of those 19 were crew. 17 others, according to Mexico's attorney general, were Mexican tourists. At some point on that short voyage back, uh, this vessel began to go down. Why it did very much under investigation at this point in time. Local news agencies there reported that there were some rough seas. Of course, whether there was a mechanical failure with the boat, that is being investigated. Uh, but one of the key questions here, Hallie, is what was the official capacity limit for this vessel? With 19 people on board, if the official limit was significantly less than that, it could have certainly made 
that boat less seaworthy and contributed it to it going down. We do know that because it was only a short distance away from shore, that rescuers were launched almost immediately. Uh, members of the Mexican Navy and Civil Patrol able to pull uh, many of those passengers from the water. Some of them were treated at a nearby hospital. Uh, but as you mentioned, four passengers have been confirmed dead as a result of this, what would be, what should be a very common trip gone horribly wrong. And this is not a trip that's taken Rarely, Hallie, this is an incredibly popular short voyage. In fact, two American divers were killed in 2022, even though they had buoys and flags up by another passing boat. That's the type of traffic uh, that this path that you see on your screen is traveled with uh, daily, in fact. And so right now, as this investigation deepens, uh, there are some conflicting reports as to uh, what may have caused this boat to go down. Uh, and certainly the families of those victims hoping answers come sooner than later. Allie. Morgan Chesky, thank you very much for that. A powerful pair of storms is set to drench the West Coast with flood alerts now in place for some 10 million people ahead of those storms which are fueled by so-called atmospheric rivers. This one in particular comes from Hawaii. It's nicknamed the Pineapple Express. And if it's given you some bad deja vu, you might be thinking of last winter and the catastrophic flooding and record snow after more than a dozen atmospheric rivers slammed California. I want to bring in meteorologist Bill Karens. What are people there bracing for now? Oh, it's a fine line, Hallie, because you need the atmospheric rivers to fill the reservoirs. We need the snowpack in the mountains, but you don't want them so severe that we're going to have flooding and damage done and you know, all those problems that we had last winter. So we haven't had many. We're actually behind in snowfall. The rainfall is a little behind, too. So it's actually welcome. We're happy we're getting these, but now we have to wait and see just how damaging they'll potentially be. So here's the storm now just off the coast. Clouds are already moving in. The heavy rain will be moving in all day during the day tomorrow. And you just showed this graphic too and the pineapple express is just a type of atmospheric river atmospheric river just means all the warm air that's in the tropics and the humid air gets sucked up by this strong storm. It, we even get these on the East Coast sometimes when we had those big, huge rainstorms earlier this winter. Those are atmospheric rivers. So it's not just something on the West Coast. We actually get them you know, on the East Coast, too. So we have a scale for how severe they are. Uh, five, the red, that would be exceptional. That's uh, some of the ones we had last year. This one's going to be kind of a middle. You'll see a lot of you know, the greens moderate, the orange is extreme. So we will see wind gusts up to 70 miles per hour on the coastline of Oregon. That's where some of the most extreme damage would be done for power outages, stuff like that. Notice California is mostly green, so we're not thinking it's going to be too severe. Doesn't mean you can't have isolated flooding problems. You mentioned about the 10 to 11 million people under the flood watches. And of course, the mountains will get the heavy snow and we're well behind. We're only like 50 percent of the typical snow for this time of year. Uh, so we'll make up a little bit of that. Up to six inches of rainfall possible. San Francisco northwards, obviously the higher terrain has the best chance of that. The winds will be high along with this atmospheric river. High wind warnings, the coastal line of Northern California, also in Oregon, and some of these gusts could potentially get up to the 50 to 70 mile per hour range. So then you do worry about some of those power outages. And you know, as far as snow goes, Hallie, uh, the last component of this, up to three feet in the higher terrain. So there's some good with these, but there's also the danger if they're too severe. This first one looks pretty moderate. The next one is going to come in this weekend, and that one's targeting the Los Angeles area a little more. We'll talk more about that during the week. Go, Karens. Thank you very much. So listen, we're learning tonight the Justice Department is now investigating a member of Congress for potentially allegedly spending money illegally with Democratic Congresswoman Cori Bush of Missouri today confirming this investigation into security spending. Watch. I have endured relentless threats to my physical safety and life. As a rank and file member of Congress, I am not entitled to personal protection by the House and instead have used campaign funds as permissible to retain security services. I have not used any federal tax dollars for personal security services. Congresswoman Bush, who denies doing anything wrong, also says her office is cooperating fully with this investigation. Kendallanian is joining us now. You heard her say there, Ken, that she's dealt with what she calls relentless threats, that she's used this money as it's permissible, as she said. She's a progressive lawmaker, former Black Lives Matter organizer, which is sort of the backdrop to some of what she's talking about here. What else do we know about the investigation and what triggered it? Hallie, we don't know exactly what the Justice Department is looking at here, but we have some clues because there were two Federal Election Commission complaints filed by two right-wing groups that essentially accused her of misspending campaign money. Not that she 
spent the money on security. That's allowed. But that one of the people she was paying for security is a man she later married and is now her husband. And an NBC News review of uh, her campaign filing shows that uh, her office spent more than $750,000 on security since 2018. So the sums of money are significant here. Um, and these uh, complaints suggested that this would be an impermissible, illegal use of campaign money, essentially co-opting campaign money into personal use. Again, uh, that appears to be one of the things the Justice Department is looking at. We don't know if that's the full extent of it. Uh, Representative Bush has also said that the FEC itself is investigating, as well as the House Ethics Committee. Uh, but it's also been reported that the Office of Congressional Ethics, that's a different organization, took a look at this and uh, took no action. So uh, unclear exactly what's at stake here, but it's a significant matter for the representative, Allie. Ken Delaney, and thank you very much for that update. And I know stay on top of it. Coming up, a lot more to get to here on the show, including what we know and what we don't know about the chip Elon Musk says his company put into somebody's brain. Plus, look at this, a Carnival cruise ship rescuing men stranded on a kayak in the Gulf of Mexico. How they ended up here. Some breaking news into us tonight. A Delaware judge voiding the Tesla CEO's $56 billion pay package. The Tesla CEO, of course, Elon Musk. It basically means that payout is canceled. The judge says Tesla's board didn't make a fair compensation plan. And this is pretty big news in the business world. The Tesla stock has slid 3% now just since markets have closed today. In a statement on X, which Musk also owns, He's reacting to this ruling, saying, never incorporate your company in the state of Delaware. Our teams are watching for more on this. We'll give you more as we get it. In other Elon Musk news, would you let one of his companies put a chip into your brain? Well, somebody did. And Musk is saying now that whoever it is seems to be recovering well, which then begs the question, actually, it begs like a million questions. What was this procedure? Who's the patient? Why did they get this implant? What exactly even is the implant? What was put into their brain? Remember, this isn't some like random surgery that Musk himself did, obviously not, right? The FDA approved Neuralink for a clinical study in patients last year, but the FDA tells us tonight it cannot confirm any information about any individual study. They're referring us over to the company, Musk's neurotech startup. Well, the company, Neuralink, hasn't gotten back to us with any more information either. Emily Aketa is joining us now. This is two things, Emily, right? It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And, oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States, Elon Musk. W what's happening? Yeah, it's absolutely getting people talking, and it's the source of intrigue and also concern. So Elon Musk is calling this product telepathy. And take a look at here. This is some of the limited information, the limited details that we know, telepathy really speaking, to what it can do. It enables control of the phone or computer merely by thinking, by your mind, by thoughts, according to Elon Musk, who tweeted about it yesterday. He says the first users will be people who lost use of their limbs, the clinical study looking for people who are experiencing uh, paralysis, quadriplegia. And the initial results, as you said, Elon Musk sa says that they are promising. Now, a clinical study uh, is expected to take six years or so. And remember, this is just one of numerous rounds of safety inspections, these different, um, these different things that they have to pass before something like this can even reach commercialization. So it still will be a while. Hallie, I should also know we reached out to Neuralink and we have not heard back for comment. What is it? Um, you, you, you touched on one of these things. We actually pull this thread. The idea of this is to help people who have lost limbs, for example, right? Like that's one of the initial, um, what are the initial hopes for this kind of technology? And I and I say that to say, you know, there's there's been some skepticism, I think, from from some corners of the idea of like a chip being implanted in your brain. It feels like a lot. Yeah, absolutely, and understandably so. But I, I think this feels like something that maybe that we would be talking about in 50 years or 100 years, very mm. futuristic. But here we are. The future is here now. And in many respects, it is very exciting. And Neuralink is one of a handful, a small handful, I should say, of companies and researchers who are looking into this, implanting uh, brain chips into humans and have begun the testing process. For instance, in 2016, you may remember, there was a 30-year-old who had a brain chip implanted, and he was able to famously 
as you're seeing on your screen, he was able to, with control through his mind, fist bump President Obama in 2016 after he suffered paralysis from a car crash. In another instance, Synchron, another major uh, leader in this kind of neurotechnology, they're conducting a, a clinical study right now, and they demonstrated how they're using brain chips to allow two people to communicate back and forth using their thoughts to control messaging systems, essentially. And so while these emerging neurotechnologies obviously extremely exciting for people with paralysis as, as a gateway to be able to, and a potentially life-changing gateway I should say. There's also, you know, the source of question and concern. All over social media today, Hallie, there's been references to sci-fi movies and concerns. And I think a lot of that is stemming around the fact of, okay, where could this technology go? What kind of regulation can there be with this brain data privacy concerns? So this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation, Hallie. Emily Aketa, thank you very much. Sure is. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Police today have arrested the son of that New Jersey imam who was shot and killed outside his mosque earlier this month. The son, along with two others, are now facing gun charges. Police say they're looking into whether the son was involved in the death and the killing and that the investigation is still ongoing. Number two, UPS is cutting 12,000 jobs this year because they say there's not as much demand and it's more expensive because of labor costs. The job cuts are expected to hit management roles and contractors and save about a billion dollars, according to the CEO. Number three, a Carnival cruise ship rescuing two people stranded on a kayak in the Gulf of Mexico. Look at this. So their boat sank. These two guys ended up in this kayak. How lucky are they, right, that the cruise ship spots them, manages to get them some first aid, some food, a medical evaluation. They were then transferred to the custody of the Mexican Navy. They're expected to be okay. Number four, U.S. figure skaters have officially won gold in the Olympics. Which Olympics, you ask? The Olympics from two years ago. Remember, Russian figure skater Kamila Valieva got disqualified yesterday. We told you about it on the show because of a positive drug result. So without Russia in the lead, the U.S. got upgraded to gold. Japan got upgraded to silver. It is the first gold for the U.S. in the team event, albeit somewhat belatedly. Number five, scientists releasing some new incredible images of more than a dozen spiral galaxies. Look at those, captured by the James Webb Space Telescope. They're sort of sort of close to our own Milky Way, like close being a relative term here, right? Scientists say they're going to give some new clues on star formation, galactic evolution. They're also pretty amazing to look at. Huh. When we come back, an exclusive follow-up to a story we've been telling you about. Are Janice Mackey Frayer getting rare access to a lab in Beijing at the center of a partnership on fighting fentanyl. That's coming up. Plus, a huge fire at a Texas chicken farm. Why it could still burn for another full day. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau firefighters, look at this, trying to get a handle on this huge fire at a Texas chicken farm. It could take days to put it out. Officials say it started in a building that had been under construction, so it's still too dangerous to send firefighters in. They say there is, at this point, no threat to people around the area. Out of our Northeast Bureau, first responders in New Hampshire rescuing a woman from inside a garbage truck. She allegedly fell into a dumpster, right, which was then picked up, emptied into the truck. Fortunately for her, somewhat miraculously, the driver noticed somebody inside, right? Obviously stopped what they were doing. The woman was brought to the hospital in serious condition. And out of our Western Bureau, Look at this, Alaska, buried under what's being called a pandemic of snow. More than 100 inches of snow falling on Anchorage so far this winter. The city's on track to break the all-time record of 134 inches. This is not, this is like really concerning. The snow is causing roofs to collapse. It's blocking streets and sidewalks. There is a positive spin on it. Look at this 20-foot tall snowman. <laughs> People call it Snowzilla in that neighborhood. To an NBC News exclusive now, our own Janice Mackey Frayer, one-on-one with the woman leading U.S. talks with China to try to stop fentanyl from getting into the U.S. Here's what she's saying after some critical negotiations today. Listen. This is a huge issue for the United States and is a huge crisis that we need to address. And we know that, that working with China is an essential part of, of any solution.
It's coming as Janice and her team get rare access to a critical lab. This access, years in the making, a lab President Biden agreed to lift sanctions on when he met with President Xi back in November. It's a move that's been key to these talks. Janice is joining us now live from Beijing. We're so glad to have you, Janice, on this story that I know has been a long time in the works here. And this comes at a really important moment here because the U.S. wants more info from China, more cooperation, more control of some of these chemicals made in China that are ingredients for fentanyl made somewhere else. What are the chances, based on your conversations here, that the, that, that the U.S. is going to get what they want out of this? Well, Hallie, this is a huge global trade that we're talking about that uses cryptocurrencies and the dark web and money laundering to get these chemical precursors, those are the ingredients that go into making fentanyl, from China to Mexico. Uh, it, we should be clear in saying that China banned fentanyl as a substance back in 2019 in cooperation with the U.S. U.S. officials have said that for the most part direct shipments from China to the U.S. have stopped. But stemming the flow of these precursor chemicals because there are thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, and most of them have legitimate uses as well. This is proving more difficult, and it's why cooperation on this issue is so important for the U.S. I sat down with Jen Daskal after she met today with Chinese officials. Here's more of what she had to say. The fact that we had this meeting today, the fact that they brought so many different representatives to the table to match our whole of government delegation is a step forward. Um, we obviously have areas of disagreement with China, but there are areas of mutual cooperation where we can and, and will continue to seek to make progress. Hallie, this is how the supply chain works. You have this thriving chemicals industry in China. Uh, the chemicals are bought and sold online, and they are shipped from China to Mexico to the drug cartels, where they are synthesized into fentanyl, an opioid we know is 50 times more powerful than heroin. It then moves into the U.S., and it's killing so many Americans. Hallie? This is, um, you talk about this, Janice, being a global trade. It is a global issue, and obviously it is something that absolutely has the president's attention here. President Biden meeting with President Xi, they talked about it. Now there's this follow-up, right? Does it mean that there is some optimism moving forward, at least on this issue between the U.S. and China, which, as you know, uh, really, it's a relationship that's been at a low point in recent years? Well, we can call it cautious optimism. That was okay. certainly the vibe we were getting from both U.S. and Chinese officials, that this was a critical first step forward. In terms of longer-term impact, that remains to be seen, uh, whether there will be the follow-through that's necessary, whether Beijing is capable of cracking down on such a massive industry, and whether there's the willingness. And, of course, we see these talks resume. There have, there's been U.S.-China cooperation before, but it's been derailed by politics. China called off the talks in 2022 after Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, and they had been sputtering uh, since 2020 when the U.S. put the two police labs on that sanctions list. So in the end, while there is that cautious optimism uh, in these meetings and the fact that they even happened. Uh, it's, it's a reminder that even on an issue as personal to Americans as the fentanyl crisis, it, it's still an issue that is secondary to politics and things could get thrown off track again if political tensions rise. Hallie. Janice Mackey Freyer, live for us there in Beijing. We're so glad to have you there, Janice, bringing the story, this interview, uh, and Thanks, this Hallie. access to us. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, some experts say the famine in Gaza is its worst ever, with Israel now being accused of using hunger as a weapon of war. That's in our original, next. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we start with the controversy over the potential role of at least a dozen UN aid workers in the October 7th terror attack on Israel. It's the same aid group called UNRWA that gives food and medical care to the two million people in Gaza. So many of those Gazans living in despair. They are desperate and hopeless now, with some experts saying it's the most intense hunger crisis they've ever seen. 
Now, Israel's facing accusations it's using hunger as a weapon of war. Our Cynthia McFadden has more. The World Food Program now warning the risk of famine in Gaza is increasing every single day. The head of the UN's emergency relief agrees and says people in Gaza face the highest levels of food insecurity ever recorded. And Human Rights Watch accusing Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war in violation of the international rules of war. Gazans jumping on aid trucks to get any food they can for themselves and their children. We are dying of hunger. And flooding the few remaining barely functioning hospitals with cases of serious malnutrition. Hospital workers facing the grim reality that sometimes they don't have food to give them or themselves. What else is left when there are homeless children, no schools, no education, no food, nothing? What else is left? We have hunger, we have starvation in some places, and the clock is sticking towards famine. One IDF colonel pointing the blame at aid organizations for people not getting enough food, telling the Times of Israel there is no food shortage in Gaza. As of now, around 200 trucks of humanitarian aid carrying food, water, and medical supplies are getting into Gaza every day. While that may sound like a lot, the U.N. says 500 trucks were going in daily before the war. It's certainly not the first time, even in recent conflicts, that a government has been accused of starving people to win military goals. Starvation has been used as a military tactic going all the way back to ancient times. Romans used starvation to defeat and destroy Carthage in 146 B.C., in the United States Civil War, President Lincoln signed the Lieber Code, which instructed Union soldiers to, quote, starve the hostile belligerent, armed or unarmed. And Adolf Hitler's so-called hunger plan starved millions of people in the Soviet Union during World War II. But it wasn't until 2018 that the U.N. Security Council unanimously and strongly condemned the use of starvation as a tactic of war because of the devastating impact it has on civilians. Of course, many factors can disrupt the food supply to populations, and yet Ukraine, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen, Syria are all facing hunger crises in the middle of conflict. Alex Duvall has studied international famine for four decades. Uh, markets are disrupted, trade is, is disrupted, food production is disrupted. But where we see real risk of famine is where hunger is deliberately used as a weapon of war. And Duvall says the concentration of food insecurity in Gaza is the worst in the last 75 years. There is no instance since World War II that compares with Gaza. There are, and there are instances that are bigger in terms of affecting much more people, much more protracted, and therefore killing larger numbers. None of them have inflicted the same level of destruction and brought about the same level of risk of mass death from starvation as the current crisis in Gaza. UNICEF says the war is damaging and destroying access to clean water, too. Cases of diarrhea are among children there, skyrocketing because of this. The reality on the ground looks like this. Desperate parents spending days looking for milk for their newborn. I don't know how he can bear this weather or the living conditions. There's no milk, no water. And hope, too, now in short supply. Cynthia is joining us now. Cynthia, we're so glad to have you here. We know, and we've covered here on this show, that even as the UN's top court wants Israel to get more supplies into Gaza right away, at the same time, we're seeing some countries, including our own, the U.S., is basically suspending funding for UNRWA, which we talked about at the top of this segment yeah. here. So, so what is the path forward here? What have you learned in your reporting about that piece of it? Gosh, I wish I had an easy answer right. for you, Hallie. I mean, essentially, put UNRWA aside for a moment. We know okay. that UNICEF, we know that uh, Save the Children, we know that the World Food Program all say they have resources ready and able to go into uh, Gaza and that they are still being blocked from doing so. Now, 200 trucks a day is not enough. Thing. But as we report in the piece, it, it sounds like a lot until you realize that food insecurity was a problem even before the war. There were 500 trucks going in a day to just keep 
you know, people's heads above water prior to war. So the situation is just getting more and more dire. And, um, you know, these babies, uh, these babies didn't create this war. So hope that we can figure out a way uh, for Israel to feel that they are protecting themselves while at the same time providing much needed food and water to the people who live in Gaza. Cynthia McFadden, thank you so much for bringing us that reporting tonight. We've got a lot more to come here on the show, including the Fed meeting tomorrow to decide what to do about interest rates, something that could absolutely affect your money. So what what, it, what does that even mean? What is the Fed going to do? What is interest rate? What? Everything you ever wanted to know about the Fed coming up in the breakdown in just a sec. So the Fed today is meeting here in Washington with a key decision expected tomorrow on whether it'll raise interest rates yet again, something the Federal Reserve has already done 11 times to fight inflation. It's the fastest they've raised rates since 1981, the year Donkey Kong came out in arcades. So far, it seems like maybe what the Fed's doing is working. Over the last six months, inflation has gone down, and the economy, again, so far, doesn't seem to be in that dreaded recession that everybody worried about, especially with new numbers out today showing a job market that's still pretty strong. So how exactly is the Fed pulling this off? Brian Chung explains in tonight's breakdown. The Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, pulling the strings to the U.S. economy for more than a century. Back in 1913, after major panics and recessions, Congress and President Woodrow Wilson created the Fed to keep things in check. Over the years, Congress tweaked the Fed's responsibilities after the Great Depression and other crises made it clear how the Fed could better steer the economy. In the late 70s, Congress explicitly said to the Fed, you have two goals here, price stability and maximum employment. Price stability and maximum employment the two big goals of its monetary policy, which it largely does through the tool of interest rates. Here's how the Fed's structured. There's a central board based in Washington, D.C., with seven members appointed by the president serving 14-year terms. Right now, its chair is Jerome Powell. We have raised interest rates by four and a half percentage points. Picked by former President Trump and reappointed by President Biden. To get a better pulse on how different regions are doing, there are also 12 Federal Reserve Bank outposts scattered across the country. Eight times a year, the central board members and Federal Reserve Bank presidents get together in D.C. for these Federal Open Market Committee meetings, where they decide on what to do with the federal funds rate. That's the interest rate that banks borrow at overnight. That rate then influences all the other things in financial markets. Banks use it as a benchmark to base the interest rates they charge you on things like mortgages and credit cards. So if it's worried about inflation, the Fed might increase rates to make borrowing more expensive, putting a damper on spending throughout the economy. But if it's concerned about a recession, it might do the opposite and lower rates to encourage people to buy more stuff and companies to invest. The Fed does this with its dual mandate in mind, stable prices and maximum employment. And it doesn't answer to the president. It's independent of the White House and Treasury. Now, the Fed does more than change interest rates. It supervises banks, visiting them, making sure they're following the rules and sometimes slapping on penalties when they aren't. Since the 2008 financial crisis, it's paid particular attention to the bigger banks. Silicon Valley Bank management failed badly. The Fed also notably issues the cash you use on a daily basis and works to keep the payment system safe. A lot of responsibilities for a central bank steering the world's largest economy. Brian is joining us now. Brian, that's a great breakdown. Hopefully people understand what this is all about. And the big question, of course, tomorrow, what are they going to do with rates? The expectation is keep them as they are. So is that like a good thing if you're trying to go buy a house, if you want those mortgage rates to drop a little bit? Yeah, well, and that's what the Federal Reserve has telegraphed, which is the reason why markets are pricing in a 98 percent chance, basically a foregone conclusion that they won't raise interest rates at the conclusion of their meeting tomorrow. For what it's worth, the expectation is the Fed could begin cutting interest rates later on this year. That might provide a little bit of relief on those mortgage rates and those credit card rates that we've seen have been so high. Again, if we're kind of thinking about the airplane analogy here, as you get towards that intersection, you don't want to just be break checking into it. You want to be softening into it. That's the reason why they might be lowering those interest rates again, as they as we discussed, that lever that they have to control essentially what direction this U.S. economy is going, especially after the big shock of the pandemic, Hallie. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Appreciate it.
That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Tonight, we could see a whole new level up in this battle over the border, with Republicans expected to recommend impeaching a top Biden official and some big questions over whether the president can shut down the border himself. We're live in just a second with a gut check on the humanitarian crisis and the potential political fallout. Also, maybe any minute, we may find out more about the president's cryptic comment that he's made up his mind on how to respond to those deadly drone attacks on U.S. troops in Jordan. So who else knows what his decision is and when might the rest of the world find out? Then, some never-before-seen video out of a Michigan court today showing the mother of a school shooter breaking down in the moments after her son killed four of his classmates. How that fits into the case against her. Plus, would you let Elon Musk put a chip in your brain? Well, somebody did. Why? We're going to get to that in just a little bit. Plus, we'll get to an NBC News exclusive live from Beijing, a word you don't often hear related to the fight against the global spread of fentanyl. Optimism. We'll explain why at this critical moment later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are starting tonight with that humanitarian crisis at the border. And House Republicans pushing what they think could be part of the solution in the next couple hours set to recommend impeaching the Homeland Security Secretary. That's what you're looking at live here. Debate uh, has, has paused for a moment. Members of Congress are eating dinner. They're just like us. It's a, it's a minute here in this debate over whether or not to essentially kick Alejandro Mayorkas out of office. We're obviously watching for a vote. We'll bring it to you when it happens. Republicans are accusing Mayorkas of, number one, refusing to follow the law, and number two, knowingly saying things that weren't true that get in the way of DHS oversight. I want to be clear here. The chances of a conviction, slim to none. Only one cabinet secretary has ever been impeached. That was back when Heinz Ketchup first came out, 1876. That vote failed. Still, over on the other side of Capitol Hill, senators are working on a different plan to try to get a handle on the border. This one, they hope, would allow the government to spend more money there and give President Biden the power to shut down the border in certain cases. It's a power President Biden definitely wants. Listen. Give me the power. I've asked for the very day I got in office. Give me the border patrol. Give me the people, give, give me the people, the judges. Give me the people who can stop this and make it work for us. So does the president really need approval from Congress to shut down the border? Current and former Homeland Security officials talking with our team say technically he could do it on his own, but that could be super chaotic because of legal challenges that would almost certainly come up right away. There's no commitment from Mexico, which would have to get on board with the plan. And then there are some questions about what's actually realistic numbers wise. What we do know numbers wise comes from polls showing most Americans want to see something done here. Nearly three quarters of voters want more money for border security and about one in seven say the border is their top issue ahead of the election this fall. We're going to get more into the politics with our Ryan Nobles in just a second. But I want to start with David Noriega, who's live for us in Eagle Pass, Texas, a place, David, that is now in the national spotlight as you're talking with Texans who are driving for miles just to be there. Why? Yeah, Hallie, so Eagle Pass is in fact now the flashpoint of many of these political conflicts between the state of Texas and its re Republican governor and the Biden administration between Republicans and Democrats more generally. And you're right, uh, th there have been Texans driving, uh, in some cases, many hours to come here. That's because they are coming here in anticipation of a uh, convoy of uh, Trump supporters, self-described patriots, that is uh, supposedly on its way to the border. Although I should say it's not exactly clear how big this convoy is or whether it will materialize realize in the way that its organizers say it will. Nevertheless, I did speak to uh, to one woman who drove more than five hours from north of Houston to be here to wait for that convoy. I, I asked her sort of what she thought about everything that's happening on the border. Here's a bit of what she had to say. I think that uh, there's a lot of criminals coming across and pedophiles. And I think there's people that need to come in, but Everything's not being done right. There's people that need to come in, she said, Hallie. She was saying that if people are fleeing a, a situation of true desperation, they should have some way of getting into the United States. At this point, given what we're seeing out of D.C., that's actually a position that you could say is from an enthusiastic Trump supporter, a position that is to the left of Joe Biden and the Democrats who are trying to gain the authority to turn away pretty much every asylum seeker who crosses the border. Hallie?
Talk about some of the skepticism, excuse me, the skepticism here, David, about the potential for a border shutdown, however it were to happen, whether it's with Congress, whether President Biden does it on his own, et cetera. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons to be skeptical, but one very important one, which you mentioned, is Mexico. So the, the, this idea of shutting down the border is being talked about a lot. It's, I think it's useful to explain exactly what that means as far as we know. Again, big caveat, we haven't actually seen any text to this bill. But as far as we know, what they're talking about is that if crossings pass a certain number, uh, the number that's been floated is an average of 5,000 apprehensions between ports of entry a day over the course of a week, or if on a certain day, apprehensions go above 8,500, then the president would have the authority to turn away every migrant who crosses the border illegally between ports of entry without giving them a chance to seek asylum. That is what, in this context, shutting the border down means. Now, that's very similar to the authority that was already wielded by both President Trump and President Biden under Title 42 during the uh, state of emergency of the pandemic. But during that time, one really, really important uh, part to making that work was the full cooperation of the Mexican government. Because when the U.S. turns these people around and puts them back on the other side of the border, they stay in Mexico. And it's up to Mexican officials at the local, state and federal level to handle the accumulating numbers of migrants. That, 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 that get wind up being sort of stuck on the Mexican side of the border. There is no indication that the Mexican government has agreed to implement any kind of program. In fact, the Mexican government, spoke, uh, the, the Mexican president, López Obrador, spoke about this at a press conference today. Here's what he had to say. Siempre buscan... They always look to blame the migrants, blame the Mexicans. Somos los principales socios comerciales we are the principal commercial partners of the United States in the world. How is the border going to close? So no indication, Hallie, that a plan like this could actually be implemented on the ground anytime soon. Hallie? David Noriega live for us there in Eagle Pass. We're glad to have you there, David. Thank you. Ryan Nobles has the other piece of this, right, because it stretches from Texas, Ryan, from the border all the way up here to Washington. Uh, and this discussion today, which is expected to go late into the night, about impeaching the Homeland Security Secretary. You have made the point, and it's a good one, that any impeachment is a political process, essentially. That is the political mechanism that we have in this country. Um, what are the stakes here for both Mayorkas, for the Biden administration, and what are the chances that this actually happens? Well, there's a very real possibility that uh, Alejandro Mayorkas will be the first cabinet secretary impeached in uh, more than 150 years. It's likely the House committee will vote along partisan lines late tonight uh, to refer this to the whole House, and Republicans probably have enough votes to make that happen. But when it comes to the politics of this, the practical implication of him actually being removed from office is remote, because then he would have to be convicted by the Senate uh, by a two-thirds majority, and the penalty would have to be removal from office, and there's really no chance that that happens. So what this becomes is essentially a debate over the way the Biden administration, through Alejandro Mayorkas, have operated and handled the situation on the border. And there's a very wide, differing view as to exactly how that's gone down. Take a listen to what we heard in this hearing today. Secretary Mayorkas's actions have forced our hand. They don't want solutions. They want a political issue. We're losing our country down there. This is a MAGA pathway of vengefulness. Uh, and so uh, Mayorkas, of course, has pushed back on this. He said the whole thing is just a political stunt and it doesn't do anything to solve the crisis at the border. Hallie. What is happening uh, on the Hill that that could actually get some traction here, right? Because if you look at the impeachment of Mayorkas, potentially, the House could impeach him. A conviction, as you point out, seems extremely unlikely in the Democrat-controlled Senate here. What about these border security talks, these bipartisan talks that are trying to get something done? Where does that stand? Well, Senator Schumer said today that they are close to a deal, but there's no text that's been released yet. We expect that sometime this week. The question then, will there be 60 votes in the Senate to even get it to the House? And if it comes to the House, Will the speaker put it on the floor? So far, he seems very skeptical that he'd be able to support that legislation. Hallie. Ryan Nobles live for us there on the Hill. Ryan, thank you. To the White House now, because any minute now, we could, we could find out how the U.S. might respond to that deadly drone attack that killed three U.S. service members in the Middle East and hurt dozens more. President Biden telling reporters he has made up his mind. Watch. Yes. 
That's it, right? Like, that's all he said. He just said yes. The rest, up to the imagination, perhaps, unless you're a member of the president's inner circle there. Because right now, we don't know, what is the president going to do? When could it happen? How much bigger could this strike or response or whatever it's going to be? How might it be different than the strikes the U.S. has already carried out against militants in the region? The president's walking a line here. On the one hand, consequences, right? A response for the killing of U.S. troops. On the other hand, he doesn't want a wider war to pop off. Remember, Iran denies involvement in this most recent attack, even though the White House says Iran-backed militants carried out the strike, that that bears the hallmarks of it. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist, who is posted up just outside the White House for us. We know the president met with his national security team. Presumably, they are read in on whatever decision he's made. Do we have any sense, based on our reporting tonight, of a possible timeline or the range of options that the president may be considering here? So, I mean, Hallie, you know how this all comes together, right? There are lots yeah. of different conversations that happen at the White House, National Security Council, the Defense Department, and all these things sort of come together. So we're pulling together bits of information from these different places. To answer your question directly on a timeline, no. We don't have an answer to that, but we do know that the president spoke with members of his national security team earlier today before he left the White House for Florida. And as he was leaving, he spoke to reporters and was asked whether he had come to a decision about what his response was going to be to the deaths of these three soldiers in Jordan and the injuries of dozens of other soldiers uh, and airmen who were, were based at this facility in Jordan. And the president said yes to that question. Fast forward a little bit, we, we were able to get some responses from the National Security Council spokesman John Kirby uh, uh, during a, a, a gathering with reporters on Air mm -hmm. Force One as it was going to Florida. He said it's very possible you'll see a tiered approach, uh, not just a single action, but potentially multiple actions over a period of time. The Defense Department during their briefing today said that they were still trying to figure out exactly what group was responsible for executing the attack, the drone strike that we saw. And so there's still some pieces that are coming together. But now that the president has greenlit something, we know that the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Secretary of State, and uh, Secretary of Energy and Treasury, these are all members of the National Security Council. They are figuring out how to operationalize the response that the president says he wants to see happen. And all these things could happen over the course of a period of time, as opposed to one instance of a strike or an economic sanction or something like that. Hallie, we may see several things. Aaron Gilchrist, live for us there outside the White House. Aaron, thank you. I know you'll be uh, staying close to a camera for, for the next hours and days to come. Appreciate it. I want to show you now some dramatic video that's just into us today. Look at this. These people look like doctors and patients you're about to see. They are not. They're actually Israeli forces raiding a hospital in the West Bank. You see it there? These troops killing three militants. The IDF says had been using the hospital as a base to plan terror attacks. It's another indication of how the Israelis are trying to crack down, not just in the West Bank, but, of course, in Gaza, obviously, since the war began there after that terror attack October 7th. But the Israeli prime minister now saying he is not going to withdraw his troops from Gaza, even if that means ruling out the possibility of a new hostage deal. With some of that framework hammered out in Paris, calling for a truce in exchange for hostages released. There's a bunch of sticking points there, but one of the biggest sticking points, how long would a truce even last? Israel says if it were to happen, it would only be temporary. Hamas says they want a permanent ceasefire. So as we're waiting to see what happens next there, our Hala Garani is embedding on a flight, evacuating very sick, very hurt Gazans from the region. People who are desperately hoping for a ceasefire of any length, just some kind of pause in the fighting. Watch. This is happening against the backdrop of renewed hopes for a ceasefire, some sort of longer term ceasefire. And that will certainly be welcome news for the tens of thousands of people who are in need of critical medical care, just like the patients behind me on this flight. Let's bring in Raf Sanchez now, who is live for us in Tel Aviv. So let's start there, right, because we're learning that a top Israeli minister is going to meet with the National Security Advisor, the White House, tomorrow, piece together these threads and where any level of optimism or pessimism is on the potential a truce deal could go through. So, Hallie, I spoke to a senior Israeli official earlier. This is not always a glass half full person, but he says there is mm. a real chance that this framework hammered out by the spy chiefs, including the CIA director in Paris over the weekend, could lead to a deal. 
He says there are sticking points. He says nothing is done until it's done. But the fact that it was discussed at the Israeli war cabinet last night is a sign of how seriously it is being taken. We heard from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu earlier today. As you said, he was speaking at a settlement in the occupied West Bank. And Halley, he is under real pressure from the far right of his own cabinet not to make concessions to Hamas. And one of the things he said was that he is not prepared to release thousands of Palestinians convicted of terrorism offenses from Israeli prisons. Now, that is one of Hamas's major demands. That appears to be a serious spanner in the works here. There may be some wiggle room. Under this proposal, the deal is for Israel's civilian hostages. Israel would have to release Palestinian prisoners in exchange, but not necessarily the most senior terror operatives. Hamas says that it is reviewing the proposal that came out of Paris. It is not at this point rejecting it out of hand or saying that it can go ahead. They are repeating their demand that the war ends as part of any deal. But again, Hallie, maybe there's some wiggle room here. A ceasefire for 60 days that Hamas yeah. could then extend further by releasing more hostages, that could be something they could live with. Hallie. We cannot overstate how many people are watching those talks and those discussions so closely, Raf. We're also watching, obviously, what has developed in the West Bank. We showed that video at the top of this introduction here, that dramatic video of this undercover hospital raid. Again, in the West Bank, not in Gaza, different area obviously. What else do we know about it and what does it signal to you? So these Israeli commandos are called in, in Hebrew uh, mustaravim. They are literally people who disguise themselves as Arabs. They go undercover in the occupied West Bank and you see them in this hospital in Jenin, the northern West Bank, 5.30 a.m. They go in, they kill one operative from Hamas, two from Islamic Jihad. They appear to have shot one of these men at very close range while he was sleeping in his hospital bed, according to medical officials. And the Palestinian Authority is saying storming a hospital is a war crime. The Israelis are saying Hamas, once again, cynically operating out of hospitals. But I think what is important here, Hallie, obviously the video is so striking, but what happened in Jenin is a potential glimpse of the future in Gaza. Israel has been really clear that going forward in Gaza, yeah. even when the war ends, its forces are going to be carrying out targeted raids like this one. And we may be seeing what happened in Jenin last night, or this morning rather, happening again and again in Gaza in the years to come. Ali. Raf Sanchez, live for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you. I want to get to some new video now coming out of a Michigan courtroom today showing the moment the mother of a mass shooter broke down in the back of a police car after her son opened fire at his high school back in 2021. Here it is. This is yeah. so. Like, I just, my son just ruined his life. I'll never see him again. That's yeah. we're not bad people. You hear her say, we're not bad people. That's Jennifer Crumbly. She is on trial right now in an unprecedented case looking to hold her accountable for what her son did in that shooting. Both Crumbly and her husband, James, are both facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter, which could put them in prison for up to 15 years. Those four counts, one for each of the four students killed by their son in that shooting. Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meir, Madison Baldwin, Justin Schilling. Adrian Broadus is joining us now. And Adrian, that clip we saw is just one piece of a pretty long video of Crumbly's reaction to the shooting in the moments after it happened. Just some of the evidence presented by prosecutors today. Tell us more. Callie, that video is 49 minutes. There are stretches of silence. And in it, as Jennifer Crumley sits in the back seat of that squad car, we see her experience a range of emotions. At one moment, she wept. And then soon after, she was angry. And that anger was on display. Watch and listen. I never really been, like, in a body even having mental issues. Like, I've never, that's, uh, he's never, he's never exerted any kind of anger. He's never exerted anything. Like, he's just, like, one of those mellow, laid-back kids. Mm -hmm. He's, we've always had a hope, and he'll talk about stuff. Like, he's, I don't get it. Right. I don't get what happened. 
Jennifer Crumbly seen there trying to wrap her head around what had just happened. Today inside of the courtroom, prosecutors are using images we also saw from inside of the home to paint this picture of gross negligence in the case against Jennifer Crumbly. We saw photos of unsecured weapons in the house where Ethan Crumbly lived in his bedroom. Right here, you're looking at paper targets that were hanging on the wall with visible bullet holes. We also saw a whiskey bottle sitting next to a bed and also the case that the murder weapon was stored in and the master bedroom opened. People might remember, Adrian, some of the other details of this. This, this came up at the time that the shooting happened, that there was um, a concerning drawing that school staff had talked with his parents about. A, a Michigan school official today told jurors he felt he had no grounds to search the backpack of Jennifer Crumbly's son before the shooting happened. Can you explain that? Yeah, so that was the former dean of students who had only been with the school four months or so at the time of the shooting. He said he had no grounds to search because there were no allegations of vaping and there were no allegations of possessing a weapon. These are rules outlined uh, by Michigan state law. By contrast, he felt Ethan Crumbly was going to hurt or harm himself. Specifically, he thought Ethan was going to try to end his own life based on the images on that math worksheet that has been brought up over and over again. That worksheet showed bullets, it showed a gun, which resembles, we now know, the murder weapon. And it also had the message on there saying, the thoughts won't stop, help me. And I'm paraphrasing here, Crumbly also wrote, my life is useless. So that former dean of students was concerned about Ethan Crumbly. That's why the parents were called to the school and told their child needed to receive mental health services or counseling that day or within 48 hours, Hallie. Adrian brought us. Adrian, thank you so much uh, with those developments late today out of that Michigan courtroom. Appreciate it. Some new details tonight after a tourist boat seemingly capsized off the coast of Cancun. We're learning four people were killed. Others taken to the hospital. You're about to see some of those ambulances there. The boat was going from an island near Cancun to the mainland when this happened. Morgan Chesky has been following the latest for us. Uh, Morgan, do we have any sense of what happened? Why? Because this was a relatively routine route. It's super popular with tourists. I mean, anybody who's been to that area knows this, air, this, uh, this location where this happened. Yeah, Hallie, this was an incredibly routine route. And right now, investigators are looking at multiple factors because it could be that a combination of things went wrong in order to cause this vessel to go down late last night. The route itself, just a few minutes ride from Cancun to the island of Isla Mujeres, a very popular tourist destination. This vessel in particular had 19 people on board. 17 of those were confirmed by Mexico's attorney general to be Mexican tourists who were going to Isla Mujeres for dinner. And then on their way back is when something went tragically wrong. That boat started to go down. Local news agencies reported that the waters around that area were choppy and that there were relatively high winds, although we don't know if weather is solely to blame here. One aspect of this that's being put under the microscope, Hallie, is what was the official capacity on this specific vessel? We're still awaiting to hear that from Mexican authorities with 19 people on board. If it was for a significantly less number, that could have absolutely contributed to it not being seaworthy and could have caused it to go down the way in which it did. A Mexican Navy and Civil Patrol were able to respond relatively quickly uh, and pull many of those passengers from the water. We've learned some of them were treated at a nearby hospital, uh, but as of last check, four were confirmed dead uh, as a result of this very normal journey uh, that went absolutely horribly wrong. Ali, just to put in perspective for you yeah, how high traffic an area this is, uh, two American divers were killed back in 2022 while diving in this area despite having flags up as required and buoys. They were struck, fatally struck, uh, by a passing boat. Hallie? Morgan Chesky, thank you very much for that reporting. A powerful pair of storms is set to drench the West Coast with some flood alerts, flood alerts going into effect for like 10 million people ahead of those storms, fueled by something called the Pineapple Express. That's an atmospheric river coming from Hawaii. If it's all giving you some bad deja vu, you may be thinking of last winter. 
and the terrible flooding and record snow after more than a dozen atmospheric rivers slammed California. Meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us now. California needs rain. California doesn't need tons of rain. That's what you worry about. And it's always the second storm that I'm always more concerned about. Typically, the first storm, the ground, you know, hasn't really rained in a while. It can absorb it better. When you get the second storm right behind it, that's usually when you get the significant flooding. And that would be this weekend after we get done with the first one. So you just mentioned the Pineapple Express. All that is is a fancy term for this atmospheric river that starts in Hawaii and then comes into the West Coast. And obviously, they call it that because the pineapples of Hawaii. So this one is not particularly strong, and it's also moving kind of quickly. So that's good. It's going to give a good dose of rain, good dose of snow, hopefully not cause too many problems. They have a scale for these things, and this one is kind of in the middle. The main concern could be the high winds in the coastline in the Pacific Northwest, specifically in Oregon. Notice California is not high on the scale for impacts with this first one. That could change, though, on Saturday and Sunday, especially SoCal uh, with the second one. So here we are, 5 p.m. tomorrow, storm moving on shore. San Francisco Bay Area, the evening rush will be the heaviest rain for you and the strongest winds. Then it moves onshore and inland as we go throughout the day on Thursday scattered showers behind it. So again, it's quick. It's in and it's out. So the main impacts, obviously, we have to worry about heavy rainfall and the potential any flooding. That's why we have about 10 to 11 million people under flood watches. We have winter storm watches that are up for the high elevations. It looks like it's mostly the central Sierra will have the best chance of getting that two to three feet of snow areas like Mammoth, Yosemite National Park. The isolated totals up to six inches of rain. That's where we worry about the flooding from San Francisco up to Napa, northwards up the coast. In Seattle and Portland, not too much for you. The mountainous areas will get a little more, but the, you know, the inland valleys, not so much. The high winds, mostly concerned northern portions of California and the coastline of Oregon, could gust 50 to 70 miles per hour. And some of the bigger cities will be in the 40 to 50 mile per hour range, but I don't think we're going to get too many power outages in the main cities. The coastal locations could be a different story. So this is kind of the primer event tomorrow, Hallie, and then we'll uh, set our sights on the weekend. Well, you're going to have a busy one, I know, Bill. We'll probably see you back here later on this week. Appreciate it. Thanks. We are learning tonight the Justice Department is now investigating a member of Congress for allegedly misspending money with Democratic Congresswoman Cori Bush of Missouri today confirming this investigation into security spending. Listen. I have endured relentless threats to my physical safety and life. As a rank and file member of Congress, I am not entitled to personal protection by the House and instead have used campaign funds as permissible to retain security services. I have not used any federal tax dollars for personal security services. Congresswoman Bush, who denies any wrongdoing, as you heard there, also says her office is cooperating fully with this investigation. Got a lot more to get to here on the show, uh, including more on some of our biggest stories and more on our original and our breakdown here tonight, including a really rare shark in Sydney Harbor, what we know about the victim's condition, and a new warning from Toyota by the companies telling the owners of tens of thousands of cars, stop driving. AI is going to try to help out some tourists at this year's Olympics. We're going to explain in our five things. But first, Elon Musk making headlines today. Would you let his company put a chip into your brain? Well, somebody did. And now Musk is saying whoever it is seems to be recovering well. OK, so that begs the question. Actually, that begs like a million questions. What was the procedure? Who's the patient? Why did they get this implant? What exactly is this implant? What did they put in this person's brain? Now listen, this is not obviously some random surgery that like Musk himself did. No, this is like an FDA approved clinical study. The FDA said, yes, Neuralink, this company, this startup, can test this on patients. But the FDA says it cannot confirm any information about any individual study. They referred us to the company, but Neuralink hasn't gotten back to us with any more either. Emily Aketa is joining us now. This is two things, Emily, right? It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States, Elon Musk. W what's happening? 
Yeah, it's absolutely getting people talking, and it's the source of intrigue and also concern. So Elon Musk is calling this product telepathy. And take a look at here. This is some of the limited information, the limited details that we know, telepathy really speaking, to what it can do. It enables control of the phone or computer merely by thinking, by your mind, by thoughts, according to Elon Musk, who tweeted about it yesterday. He says the first users will be people who lost use of their limbs, the clinical study looking for people who are experiencing uh, paralysis, quadriplegia. And the initial results, as you said, Elon Musk sa says that they are promising. Now, a clinical study uh, is expected to take six years or so. And remember, this is just one of numerous rounds of safety inspections, these different, um, these different things that they have to pass before something like this can even reach commercialization. So it still will be a while. Hallie, I should also know we reached out to Neuralink and we have not heard back for comment. What is it? Um, you, you, you touched on one of these things. We're actually pull this thread. The idea of this is to help people who have lost limbs, for example, right? Like that's one of the initial, um, what are the initial hopes for this kind of technology? And I, and I say that to say, you know, there's, there's been some skepticism, I think, from, from some corners of the idea of like a chip being implanted in your brain. It feels like a lot. Yeah, absolutely, and understandably so. But I, I think this feels like something that maybe that we would be talking about in 50 years or 100 years, very mm. futuristic. But here we are. The future is here now. And in many respects, it is very exciting. And Neuralink is one of a handful, a small handful, I should say, of companies and researchers who are looking into this, implanting uh, brain chips into humans and have begun the testing process. For instance, in 2016, you may remember, there was a 30-year-old who had a brain chip implanted, and he was able to famously as you're seeing on your screen, he was able to, with control through his mind, fist bump President Obama in 2016 after he suffered paralysis from a car crash. In another instance, Synchron, another major uh, leader in this kind of neurotechnology, they're conducting a, a clinical study right now, and they demonstrated how they're using brain chips to allow two people to communicate back and forth, using their thoughts to control messaging systems, essentially. And so while these emerging neurotechnologies obviously extremely exciting for people with paralysis as a gateway to be able to and a potentially life-changing gateway I should say there's also you know the source of question and concern all over social media today Hallie there's been references to sci-fi movies and concerns and I think a lot of that is stemming around the fact of okay where could this technology go what kind of regulation can there be with this brain data privacy concerns so this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation Hallie Emily Aketa thank you very much sure is Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Broadway icon Cheetah Rivera has died today at the age of 91. She's a two-time Tony winner. She was in Chicago, Kiss of the Spider Woman. She was known for playing Anita in West Side Story. Rivera's daughter says she died after a brief illness. Number two, police today arresting the son of that New Jersey imam who was shot and killed outside his mosque earlier this month. The son, along with two others, are now facing gun charges. Police say they're looking into whether he was involved in his father's death. The investigation, they say, still ongoing. Number three, Toyota is warning the owners of a whole bunch of older Corollas, about 50,000 cars, to stop driving them immediately, go get them fixed, because their airbag inflators could explode. We're talking about 2003 to 2004 Corollas, Corolla Matrix cars, some of the RAV4s from 2004 to 2005. So if you're driving around a 20-year-old RAV4, you should pay attention to this. Toyota did not say whether any injuries or deaths prompted this do not drive warning, but it's something you should know about. Number four, Paris is planning to integrate AI into some of its systems to help tourists visiting for the summer's Olympics. They're gonna give out handheld devices that can translate between French and 16 other languages right on the spot. Thousands of transportation workers are gonna get them ahead of the games. It's to help basically anybody who's like lost on the metro there. Number five, scientists releasing some of these incredible new pictures, new images of more than a dozen spiral galaxies. Look at this, all of them captured by the James Webb Space Telescope. They're kind of close to our very own Milky Way, although close is a relative term. Scientists say they're gonna give them some new clues on how stars form, on how galaxies evolve. Popping a gummy and looking at those, man, you got a night. When we come back, an NBC News exclusive, our team going one-on-one -on -one with the woman leading U.S. talks with China to stop the spread of fentanyl. Plus, researchers finding a deadly flu among penguins. Why they're so worried about what could happen if this thing gets to Antarctica. Next.
NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams have done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Pakistan, a court sentencing former Prime Minister Imran Khan to 10 years in prison for revealing state secrets. His lawyers say this trial was illegal, that they weren't able to defend Khan or cross-examine anybody. They're promising to fight this ruling. The cricket player turned politician is already serving a three-year prison term, and there are a bunch of other cases pending against him. His supporters say they're meant to sideline Khan ahead of parliamentary elections. Out of Australia, a woman's been seriously hurt after a rare shark attack in Sydney Harbor, according to officials there. She is fortunately in stable condition, but her right leg's been hurt. Experts who reviewed images of the bite marks say she was probably attacked by a bull shark. And out of the Falkland Islands, researchers have found about 35 penguins dead from avian flu. Remember, that's a disease that has decimated bird populations all around the world. Now, there's some good news here. Falkland penguins rarely travel to Antarctica, about 800 miles to the south. Scientists are worried that if this flu does get to Antarctica, it could spread very fast among penguins there because they gather in such big and tightly packed colonies. To an NBC News exclusive now, our own Janice Mackey Freyer, one-on-one with the woman leading U.S. talks with China to try to stop fentanyl from getting into the U.S. Here's what she's saying after some critical negotiations today. This is a huge issue for the United States. It is a huge crisis that we need to address. And we know that, that working with China is an essential part of, of any solution. Janice and her team also getting access, rare access, to this lab. You see it here. The President Biden agreed to lift sanctions on when he met with the Chinese president back in November, a move that has been key to these talks. Janice is joining us now from Beijing. We're so glad to have you, Janice, on this story that I know has been a long time in the works here. And this comes at a really important moment here because the U.S. wants more info from China, more cooperation, more control of some of these chemicals made in China that are ingredients for fentanyl made somewhere else. What are the chances, based on your conversations here, that the, that, that the U.S. is going to get what they want out of this? Well, Hallie, this is a huge global trade that we're talking about that uses cryptocurrencies and the dark web and money laundering to get these chemical precursors, those are the ingredients that go into making fentanyl, from China to Mexico. Uh, it, we should be clear in saying that China banned fentanyl as a substance back in 2019 in cooperation with the U.S. U.S. officials have said that for the most part, direct shipments from China to the U.S. have stopped. But stemming the flow of these precursor chemicals, because there are thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, and most of them have legitimate uses as well, this is proving more difficult. And it's why cooperation on this issue is so important for the U.S. I sat down with Jen Daskal after she met today with Chinese officials. Here's more of what she had to say. The fact that we had this meeting today, the fact that they brought so many different representatives to the table to match our whole of government delegation is a step forward. Um, we obviously have areas of disagreement with China, but there are areas of mutual cooperation where we can and, and will continue to seek to make progress. Hallie, this is how the supply chain works. You have this thriving chemicals industry in China. Uh, the chemicals are bought and sold online, and they are shipped from China to Mexico, to the drug cartels, where they are synthesized into fentanyl. An opioid we know is 50 times more powerful than heroin. It then moves into the U.S., and it's killing so many Americans. Hallie? This is, um, you talk about this, Janice, being a global trade. It is a global issue, and obviously it is something that absolutely has the president's attention here. President Biden meeting with President Xi, they talked about it. Now there's this follow-up, right? Does it mean that there is some optimism moving forward, at least on this issue between the U.S. and China, which, as you know, uh, really, it's a relationship that's been at a low point in recent years? Well, we can call it cautious optimism. That was okay. certainly the vibe we were getting from both U.S. and Chinese officials, that this was a critical first step forward. In terms of longer-term impact, 
that remains to be seen, uh, whether there will be the follow through that's necessary, whether Beijing is capable of cracking down on such a massive industry and whether there's the willingness. And of course, we see these talks resume. There have, there's been U.S.-China cooperation before, but it's been derailed by politics. China called off the talks in 2022 after Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, and they had been sputtering uh, since 2020 when the U.S. put the two police labs on that sanctions list. So in the end, while there is that cautious optimism uh, in these meetings and the fact that they even happened. Uh, it's, it's a reminder that even on an issue as personal to Americans as the fentanyl crisis, it, it's still an issue that is secondary to politics and things could get thrown off track again if political tensions rise. Hallie. Janice Mackey Freyer live for us there in Beijing. We're so glad to have you there, Janice, bringing the story, this interview uh, and Thanks, this Hallie. access to us. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, some experts say the famine in Gaza is its worst ever, with Israel now being accused of using hunger as a weapon of war. That's in our original, next. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we start with the controversy over the potential role of at least a dozen UN aid workers in the October 7th terror attack on Israel. It's the same aid group called UNRWA that gives food and medical care to the two million people in Gaza. So many of those Gazans living in despair. They are desperate and hopeless now, with some experts saying it's the most intense hunger crisis they've ever seen. Now, Israel's facing accusations it's using hunger as a weapon of war. Our Cynthia McFadden has more. <laughs> The World Food Program now warning the risk of famine in Gaza is increasing every single day. The head of the UN's emergency relief agrees and says people in Gaza face the highest levels of food insecurity ever recorded. And Human Rights Watch accusing Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war in violation of the international rules of war. Gazans jumping on aid trucks to get any food they can for themselves and their children. We are dying of hunger. And flooding the few remaining barely functioning hospitals with cases of serious malnutrition. Hospital workers facing the grim reality that sometimes they don't have food to give them or themselves. What else is left when there are homeless children, no schools, no education, no food, nothing? What else is left? We have hunger, we have starvation in some places, and the clock is ticking towards famine. One IDF colonel pointing the blame at aid organizations for people not getting enough food, telling the Times of Israel there is no food shortage in Gaza. As of now, around 200 trucks of humanitarian aid carrying food, water, and medical supplies are getting into Gaza every day. While that may sound like a lot, the U.N. says 500 trucks were going in daily before the war. It's certainly not the first time, even in recent conflicts, that a government has been accused of starving people to win military goals. Starvation has been used as a military tactic going all the way back to ancient times. Romans used starvation to defeat and destroy Carthage in 146 B.C., in the United States Civil War, President Lincoln signed the Lieber Code, which instructed Union soldiers to, quote, starve the hostile belligerent, armed or unarmed. And Adolf Hitler's so-called hunger plan starved millions of people in the Soviet Union during World War II. But it wasn't until 2018 that the U.N. Security Council unanimously and strongly condemned the use of starvation as a tactic of war because of the devastating impact it has on civilians. Of course, many factors can disrupt the food supply to populations. And yet Ukraine, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Yemen, Syria are all facing hunger crises in the middle of conflict. Alex Duvall has studied international famine for four decades. Uh, markets are disrupted, trade is, is disrupted, food production is disrupted. But where we see real risk of famine is where hunger is deliberately used as a weapon of war. And Duvall says the concentration of food insecurity in Gaza 
is the worst in the last 75 years. There is no instance since World War II that compares with Gaza. There are, and there are instances that are bigger in terms of affecting much more people, much more protracted and therefore killing larger numbers. None of them have inflicted the same level of destruction and brought about the same level of risk of mass death from starvation as the current crisis in Gaza. UNICEF says the war is damaging and destroying access to clean water too. Cases of diarrhea among children there skyrocketing because of this. The reality on the ground looks like this. Desperate parents spending days looking for milk for their newborn. I don't know how he can bear this weather or the living conditions. There's no milk, no water. And hope, too, now in short supply. Cynthia is joining us now. Cynthia, we're so glad to have you here. We know, and we've covered here on this show, that even as the UN's top court wants Israel to get more supplies into Gaza right away, at the same time, we're seeing some countries, including our own, the U.S., is basically suspending funding for UNRWA, which we talked about at the top of this segment yeah. here. So, so what is the path forward here? What have you learned in your reporting about that piece of it? Gosh, I wish I had an easy answer right. for you, Hallie. I mean, essentially, put UNRWA aside for a moment. We know okay. that UNICEF, we know that uh, Save the Children, we know that the World Food Program all say they have resources ready and able to go into uh, Gaza and that they are still being blocked from doing so. Now, 200 trucks a day is not nothing. Thing. But as we report in the piece, it sounds like a lot until you realize that food insecurity was a problem even before the war. There were 500 trucks going in a day to just keep, you know, people's heads above water prior to war. So the situation is just getting more and more dire. And, um, you know, these babies, uh, these babies didn't create this war. So hope that we can figure out a way uh, for Israel to feel that they are protecting themselves while at the same time providing much needed food and water to the people who live in Gaza. Cynthia McFadden, thank you so much for bringing us that reporting tonight. We've got a lot more to come here on the show, including the Fed meeting tomorrow to decide what to do about interest rates, something that could absolutely affect your money. So what what, what does that even mean? What is the Fed going to do? What is interest rate? What? Everything you ever wanted to know about the Fed coming up in the breakdown in just a sec. So the Fed today is meeting here in Washington with a key decision expected tomorrow on whether it'll raise interest rates yet again. Something the Federal Reserve has already done 11 times to fight inflation. It's the fastest they've raised rates since 1981 the year Donkey Kong came out in arcades. So far, it seems like maybe what the Fed's doing is working. Over the last six months, inflation has gone down, and the economy, again, so far, doesn't seem to be in that dreaded recession that everybody worried about, especially with new numbers out today showing a job market that's still pretty strong. So how exactly is the Fed pulling this off? Brian Chung explains in tonight's breakdown. The Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, pulling the strings to the U.S. economy for more than a century. Back in 1913, after major panics and recessions, Congress and President Woodrow Wilson created the Fed to keep things in check. Over the years, Congress tweaked the Fed's responsibilities after the Great Depression and other crises made it clear how the Fed could better steer the economy. In the late 70s, Congress explicitly said to the Fed, you have two goals here, price stability and maximum employment. Price stability and maximum employment, the two big goals of its monetary policy, which it largely does through the tool of interest rates. Here's how the Fed's structured. There's a central board based in Washington, D.C., with seven members appointed by the president serving 14-year terms. Right now, its chair is Jerome Powell. We have raised interest rates by four and a half percentage points. Picked by former President Trump and reappointed by President Biden. To get a better pulse on how different regions are doing, there are also 12 Federal Reserve Bank outposts scattered across the country. Eight times a year, the central board members and Federal Reserve Bank presidents get together in D.C. for these Federal Open Market Committee meetings, where they decide on what to do with the federal funds rate. 
That's the interest rate that banks borrow at overnight. That rate then influences all the other things in financial markets. Banks use it as a benchmark to base the interest rates they charge you on things like mortgages and credit cards. So if it's worried about inflation, the Fed might increase rates to make borrowing more expensive, putting a damper on spending throughout the economy. But if it's concerned about a recession, it might do the opposite and lower rates to encourage people to buy more stuff and companies to invest. The Fed does this with its dual mandate in mind, stable prices and maximum employment. And it doesn't answer to the president. It's independent of the White House and Treasury. Now, the Fed does more than change interest rates. It supervises banks, visiting them, making sure they're following the rules and sometimes slapping on penalties when they aren't. Since the 2008 financial crisis, it's paid particular attention to the bigger banks. Silicon Valley Bank management failed badly. The Fed also notably issues the cash you use on a daily basis and works to keep the payment system safe. A lot of responsibilities for a central bank steering the world's largest economy. Brian is joining us now. Brian, that's a great breakdown, helping people understand what this is all about. And the big question, of course, tomorrow, what are they going to do with rates? The expectation is keep them as they are. So is that like a good thing if you're trying to go buy a house, if you want those mortgage rates to drop a little bit? Yeah, well, and that's what the Federal Reserve has telegraphed, which is the reason why markets are pricing in a 98 percent chance, basically a foregone conclusion that they won't raise interest rates at the conclusion of their meeting tomorrow. For what it's worth, the expectation is the Fed could begin cutting interest rates later on this year. That might provide a little bit of relief on those mortgage rates and those credit card rates that we've seen have been so high. Again, if we're kind of thinking about the airplane analogy here, as you get towards that intersection, you don't want to just be break checking into it. You want to be softening into it. That's the reason why they might be lowering those interest rates again, as they as we discussed, that lever that they have to control essentially what direction this U.S. economy is going, especially after the big shock of the pandemic, Hallie. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.